description of the deck. He's playing three copies of High Priest, and you know it's ingrained in everybody's head to just kill the High Priest when you drop it on turn two, just mm -hmm. kill it. So he said, you know, if you want it to die, you play it on turn two, and just put it out there, and then you follow up with, you know, Smiters, Desecration Demons, and just beat them down with that. Uh, or if you actually want to use the High Priest, play it late. And so he's kind of he's kind of got uh, more of a, a muscle, I guess more muscle in the deck to kind of go aggro rather than relying on triggering a high priest. Now Michael Rooks, a player from Alexandria, Virginia, uh, has an SCG runner-up in Washington, D.C. Also a lot of PTQ top eights, he says here. And he always says that he plays brews or semi-brews, and he's doing that this weekend because even though it does say Black Green on the screen, Black Green Rock, that the Jeff Hoogland took to an Invitational top eight, kind of putting that deck on the map with Desecration Demon and some other things, his version is a lot different and that's one of the reasons why Demonic Taskmaster, you see Brad <laughs> reading it. So We're going to bring it up. It's from Evanston Restored. It's a 4-3 flyer, and it, it, you can only control that or you have to sacrifice something else, unless you're controlling other demon creature. We're going to bring it up because I haven't actually seen it for a while, yeah. and I just got the deck list in front of me. I'm like, Demonic Taskmaster, wrecking my brain <laughs> right. to remember exactly what it's, it does. It's that whole you know theme with controlling just one creature. So as you can see, Brad uh, played a turn two high priest expecting it to possibly die and following it up with a smiter kind of the exact uh, sequence I was saying except the high priest actually lived yeah so that to me <laughs> indicates Brad has some muscle in his hand so there you see the taskmaster a 4-3 for three mana and then at the beginning of your upkeep sacrifice a creature other than demonic task taskmaster so it's a 4-3 for three flying and uh, you if you just control that then you're good that's that's it so he's gonna swing in with the taskmaster here on his fourth turn you take a look at Rook's deck list here. Uh, again, a lot different than what we're normally been seeing for Black Green recently, as you saw him play Grim Backwoods for the turn. He's got Mutilates, which is kind of what makes this deck tick. Um, you basically trying to abuse Mutilate as best he can. Doesn't have a ton of swaps in play right now, but Mutilate is kind of the base of the deck, the removal, kind of trying to abuse that card. Um, he's got the four Demonic Taskmaster, three Disciple Bulls, four Thrag Tusk. He also has three Homicidal Seclusion, a card that we'll probably bring up at some point for you guys, all about controlling one creature. And then Haunted Plate Mail as well. So there are a lot of new cards, or cards we just haven't been seen for a little while in this deck. So Brad uh, looks like he's going to attack with the Smiter, then backs off after surveying the board in his hand, kind of... Uh... Still considering things here. Looks like maybe he's going to go all in. This is like a matchup here where you know Brad has kind of Brad has to kind of figure out what Rooks is up to mm -hmm. um, because I mean Demonic Taskmaster obviously not a card that you're going to see a lot of in Standard or haven't seen a lot of recently or if at all in Standard right. and you know you have to figure out what he's kind of up to because you know there's certainly a black green shell and Brad has been testing the black green deck that Hoogland did make top of the Invitational with and has been seeing a lot of success on Magic Online so you know he's probably got an idea of what he thinks is in Rooks's deck. But not everything. So right. he's being very cautious with his attacks and how he wants to go about, you know, starting this game off as yeah. we move to the mid game. He seemed pretty impressed with that black green deck in his article, uh, as, he, as he mentioned. So he does swing in with uh, Locks It on Smiter and the High Priest, follows it up with uh, a second High Priest and an Avacyn's Pilgrim. So Michael Rooks now at 15, Brad Nelson at 16, and Michael Rooks takes out the Locks It on Smiter with an abrupt decay at end of turn. Yeah, abrupt decaying there so that High Priest can't get active. You know, he doesn't want to abrupt decay too early, so he does take some damage on the chin. The two creatures come down post-combat, and now it's a pretty good time to abrupt decay, taking care of the biggest creature, and now the Taskmaster can actually stand tall on this board. Yeah. So Taskmaster in for another four, going to knock Brad to 12 here, and Michael Rooks passes the turn without a land drop. You see Rook's standing, he has another Taskmaster in his hand, he also has a Thrak Tusk as well, he's just missing the fifth land at this moment. Of course, Thrak Tusk being a very, very good magic card, as we know, works out pretty well with the Taskmaster. You can sacrifice the front half, get the Beast token, do some blocking maybe, and then you'll actually have the Taskmaster left over. So I actually kind of like that card in, in his deck, because you can tell he sculpted his deck around making it so that the drawback is just completely irrelevant. So a Cartel Aristocrat for Brad Nelson pre-combat here might force Rooks' hand to make a to have a response to the aristocrat before it comes in so that Nelson can't pump out a 5-5 demon token. 5-5 is going to be better than everything Rooks actually will have at this point. All right, Brad. Swinging with just the lone Avacyn's Pilgrim for an extra one point of damage. Going to knock Michael to 13, Brad Nelson at 12. Brad with, uh, with four creatures on board, but Michael Rooks with the... The big, or the lone fatty. I guess lone being the <laughs> <laughs> the operative word there. 
it's all by itself as a Taskmaster. And, but, you know, the, the, the interesting thing here is that he keeps getting aggressive, keeps sending in for four. He might have to hold off now because Aristocrat can basically make a 5-5 five, five right. at will. Sacrifice to the Pilgrim. Morbid will be in effect. And then he can activate his, well, e either one of his high priests since they're both sure. active now. He yeah. put out a 5-5 five, five demon. So we'll see what Rooks can do about this situation because Taskmaster, I don't think, can get frisky anymore. Yeah, I agree. So Brad plays a Temple Garden tap, passes a turn to Michael Rooks. Michael shaking his head, trying to figure out how he wants to get out of this situation. Pretty much exactly what you were saying. Uh, and he did draw his fifth land. It looked like he drew a Woodland Cemetery for the turn. So, you know, he can play that and play a Thraktos and move up to 19 as you see the cemetery come into play. But is that really going to do anything for him in this game by playing Thraktos going up to 19, knowing that a 5-5 Demon is going to be coming shortly? Now, do you put yourself in a situation where you want to get rid of that Taskmaster because you want, you'd want you rather have the front half of the Thrag Tusk? You know, try to just swing with the, the Taskmaster, say, all right, I'll run it into a 5-5? Five five. Does that... I mean, it's I mean, it's a, it's definitely an option. Right. I don't know if it's a good one, but right. it's an option. And basically, you're just choosing the, the front half of Thrag Tusk over the Taskmaster. Yeah. Homicidal Seclusion is the card that Rooks did play this turn. Opted not to go with the Thrag Tusk, goes, does go with the Seclusion, as you see that on the screen. Plus three, plus one, and has life link, but Tragic Slip does not care about that. So the Morbid on that, as Brad does make a 5-5 five, five Demon, is going to allow him to untap and swing with basically whatever he wants to. Yeah, Brad has set himself up nicely here, clearing uh, Michael's lone creature, and now is going to be able to swing in for uh, quite a bit of damage. So he's got a 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so he can potentially swing in for 9 points of damage here. Uh, you know, if he has a Township, he can make a 13 if he'd like to. You know, again, deciding exactly how he wants to attack. Do I want to leave up a High Priest to be able to threaten another 5-5 five, five Demon? All that good stuff. And just the demon is going to swing in here for Brad. Knock Michael to nine life. And then Brad follows that up with a voice of resurgence. Yep. And a third high priest. It, yeah, another high priest. So now there's your voice token. Morbid is triggered now. So it looks like, yeah, we're going to pump out two demons. I see exactly what he's going to do here. So he's going to make a demon. It's going to give enough creatures to actually make another demon. So now he's going to pump up. Pump out basically two five fives and voice resurgences just did a million a million yeah yeah right the, now. a giant elemental yeah and, and Michael Rooks draws his card for the turn and scoops him up I think it's an easy time to yeah. even <laughs> mutilate right now with all those woodland cemeteries out there and that grim back with I think mutilate was for minus one minus one yeah right I don't there. think he had much of a mutilate <laughs> going on there it was kind of like in, in yeah I don't even know if it was infest. Uh, range yeah, I don't, I, yeah, expensive <laughs> infest at that. You take a look at Rooks' uh, swamps. He has 12 swamps and 4 overrun things. So he actually has 16, which is kind of the number, the sweet spot that a lot of people have been going for to make me look pretty good. But, you know, there are draws that open themselves up to actually not having the necessary swamps to cast a good relate because he does have 4 Woodland Cemeteries, that Singleton Grim Backwoods, and 4 Mutavolts. That's a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. The Mutilate, uh, not so effective. But despite this being the uh, and uh, Brad called it this in his article actually this week. It, was, he, it wasn't Michael Brooks's version of Black Green, but Black Green is the mono black control deck of the format yeah. uh, right now. Uh, although Michael's deck is not really, it does not following the typical pattern of a ton of removal mm -hmm. and then like some some sort of win condition. His deck actually, as you saw there, is mostly based on having one guy in play and trying to go all the way with that. Uh, another interesting card in the list: Haunted Plate Mail yep. from. Uh, M14. Very uh, interesting choice there. I think a card that we'll see a lot more of after rotation, or yeah. at least I'm hoping, just because that card is probably my favorite card from M14, just because of like flavor and it's the cool and it's kind of like a build around me card. Or at least like a, it, it's a unique win condition. Right. That right. I actually like quite a bit. It is one of the more uh, flavorful cards too. I believe designed by Gavin Verhey. Oh. I, I think. I thought I saw Gavin tweet that he had come up with. That was one of his first designs. Uh, so very cool. So we'll take a look at the sideboards here. We will start with Michael Rooks, who does have two Barter and Blood, two Putrefy, a Seven of Bloodline, two Encroaching Waste, another card from M14, two Duress, two Curse of Death Soul, two Deathrite Shaman, and two Vraska the Unseen in his sideboard. I mean, a lot of options, obviously. Um, you know, we're in, I wouldn't say he's like in a control mirror, but he's trying to beat a mid-range deck. Um, you know, a card like Barter and Blood is one that you would kind of see against a creature-heavy deck most times against Brad's deck, not really at its best. Right, I mean, Brad's deck kind of wants that effect yeah. in a way. Uh, at least he's, he's certainly not scoffing at it, uh, so that, that doesn't help him. He's got a couple of Putrefies uh, and one Sever, 
that can uh, help deal with like m multiple demon tokens, for example, or you know anything that that he's got a. Uh, Curse of Death Soul, I think, being like the big one in the oh, sideboard. Yeah, yeah. You know, we saw Reed do cast that against Grant and Grand Prix Miami a couple months ago. Um, it being an absolute backbreaker against him. Reed only had one of those in the sideboard, kind of a miser's one of that he had access to. Rooks has two of them. I think he can play a really important role, assuming that he can actually get himself in a position where when he does cast that, it is kind of the backbreaker that it's meant to be. Right. I mean, it is. If there's any deck that this, that Curse of Death Soul is just incredible against, it's a junk aristocrat yeah. deck. Uh, Brad does have a little bit more uh, resilience to it, I think, in this particular build. Yep. Still not, you know, great, but it, having something like Loxodon Smiter doesn't care too much. I mean, it cares about a quarter of its, <laughs> of its power toughness. It is actually that. a little bit interesting because his deck is a little bit more resilient, as you said, to that card than uh, previous iterations have been. Again, Desecration Demon as a 3 of, Loxodon Smiter as a 3 of, but the kind of thing that stands out to me is that Lingering Souls for Brad this weekend is only a 2 of, mm -hmm. where in a lot of cases it's been a 4 of in Junk Aristocrats. Kind of one of the cards that makes the deck tick. And I think we can all agree that Souls really isn't at its best right now because of, you know, Kibler's green, or Kibler's red-green aggro deck. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of bonfires looming, a lot of Thermal Hellkites out there. Slingering Souls isn't really great, so as a result, Brad scales back on those. Makes Curse of Death Soul actually a lot worse against him. Right. Um, cards in Brad's sideboard really quickly to see both players getting ready for game two. He's got an ultimate price, he's got an Underworld Connections, three Garrick Relentless, three Unflinching Courage, two Appetite for Brains, two Putrefy, that third Lingering Souls in his sideboard, and owes that, and a Scavenging is. So, a lot of options about how he wants to go to go about beating a control deck like this one, I think Obes that is the easy one that he's going to bring in. Yeah. And we're underway. So uh, Brad has a turn one Avacyn's Pilgrim. Michael Rooks with uh, just a couple of land drops. And Brad plays his second land. So what has he got for us with three mana? A lot of different cards in his hand right now. He's got yeah. a Tragic Slip. He's got a Doom Traveler in his hand, it looks like. Skirstack High Priest looks like he's going to join the party in there. Here comes the Traveler. He also has an Underworld Connections and a Garrick Relentless in his hand, too, Joey. So he's got a lot of different cards and a lot of different angles yeah. to go for right now as Abrupt Decay takes care of the High Priest. Another card advantage engine in the uh, Underworld Connections. There's three minutes of Taskmaster. Okay. Yeah, so Michael Rooks has a, an Abrupt Decay at end of turn to deal with the High Priest and follows it up with a Taskmaster on his turn, leaving Brad with a Doom Traveler and an Avacyn's Pilgrim and two lands. Again, if you just take a look at Rooks' mana base for this game, kind of the same thing that we saw last game, one Swamp, even though he has right. three lands. He's got the Woodland Cemetery and a um, Mutable in play right now. So, you know, as, as much as I think his deck is geared towards casting Mutilate, or at least having it be favorable, mm -hmm. again, he can't really control his what, what lands he draws. Right. You know, percentages will say that he'll draw more Swamps than not, but these draws can happen quite a bit of the time, and as a result, his mutilates are never going to be, or does, I, mean, I don't want to say never, but they're just not anywhere near as good as I think you want them to be in this matchup. Right, he's got 16 swamps in his uh, in his main deck, but mutilate uh, not looking so good so far. So, uh, lingering souls for Brad on his turn, and he passes back to Michael Rooks. I think, with... I think mutilate's the card he drew this turn, too. Yeah. So Taskmaster swings in, Lingering Souls token gets in the way, also a Spirit token gets in the way, and passes back to Brad, Brad untapped. Life no. totals right now, Michael Rooks at 20, Brad Nelson at 18, just from his own Shockland, I believe. Yeah, no land there from uh, from Rooks either, so now he's kind of stuck. He's got another Taskmaster in his hand, I think he drew Mutilate for the turn last turn, but he can't, he, you know, he can't really do anything at this moment. Uh, you know, like, he's taking some hits here. Nothing, like, substantial, as you're going to see Nelson flashback and Lingering Souls. But, you know, it's kind of like, I, I think that Taskmaster just might want to stay back on defense now yeah. until he can actually find some lands as he draws another non-land card for the turn. So Brad swings in with his two one-power guys, flashes back the Lingering Souls, as you mentioned. Brad missing his land drop on his third and fourth turn as well. So there you see a sign in blood from Michael Rooks. Did you find a land, Michael? We're going to find out. It looks like he may have, or at least he's got a card. Yeah, there's a second uh, Mutavolt. So, Mutavolt Go is the play from Michael Rooks. Doesn't really feel like swinging with a Taskmaster just to get jump blocked by a spirit or even uh, triple blocked. 
Yeah, yeah. three spirits. And can get can get triple block. Can also Brack can also just say, all right, I'll take four. Right. And start attacking back for more damage. He's gonna play a lots on Smiter off the Pilgrim and two lambs and pass the turn back. Again, a missed land drop for Brad Nelson, but he's still got plenty of action. I mean, building a board. Yeah. So here we have the okay. mutilate that you, you believe he drew, and uh, it is for I believe one. Yep. But that will deal with the Doom Traveler, the three spirits, and leave one spirit from the Doom Traveler, and a locks it on Smiter on Brad's side. So you saw that Rooks played the Mutilate before actually playing his land. Um, he did draw an Overgrown Tomb for the turn. Doesn't want to give everything minus two, minus two, minus one, minus one. Certainly sufficient for what the Mutilate was right. on top. It doesn't change anything exactly. by having additional Swamp. And locks it on Smiter going to come in. For Brad Nelson and the Taskmaster gets in the way, but Brad has a, um, a tragic slip yeah, to make, make it, sure his smiter survives. Make it into a 3 2, so it's going to win that combat. But I think if you're Rooks, you're absolutely thrilled that that's how the turn goes. He's going to play a haunted plate mail and pass the turn back because, you know, Nelson's having a little bit of difficulty with mana. You're more than happy to trade your Taskmaster at this juncture for a tragic slip because you know you have multiple plays now. With a, you know, a haunted plate mail, he's got another task master in his hand. He can activate the plate mail thing and trade, and trade with the smiter if he wants to. There so he's see. got most of the options. There you see haunted plate mail, four mana, essentially a four four mana four four. Yeah. With some other opportunities. So uh, you saw an abrupt decay to deal with the smiter from Michael Rooks. And a flashback lingering souls there. Mm -hmm. or, uh, front half, I'm sorry. Front half of lingering souls there from Brad Nelson. Looks like Rooks drew, or at least had another mutilate. You also see seven of the bloodline in his hand yeah, as well. So and another Taskmaster in hand. Those spirit tokens are of no threat to him right now. So Nelson's going to take a look at the haunted plate mail again. Plate mail can become a four-four creature in any time if you're old school. It kind of reminds me of maybe like a Chimeric Idol type yeah, card. Yeah. Um, and here comes. Looks like this. Mutilate. Yeah, this is going to be mutilate again. It's these are those spirit tokens. I like casting mutilate here instead of actually uh, instead of using the sever. I think Sever's value is going to be much greater over the course of this game than the Mutilate will be. Just pick off a better creature. Yeah. So, Brad Nelson, clear board, four lands, facing down a Haunted Plate Mail double Mutavolt from Michael Rooks. Brad at 12, Michael at 15, and a Desecration Demon from Brad. Four mana six six in the house. Rooks' deck does have a lot of removal. Doesn't have to be terrified of that card. Does have that sever as we mentioned. This right. card one of the reasons actually holds the sever. If he knows Brad's list, which I don't think many people do, but if he knows Brad's list, or, you know he can save the sever. Use the mutilate to take care of the spirit token. Sever takes care of the demon. He can keep crashing in with the mutal with the mutable and the haunted plate mail. So there is going to be a sever the bloodline. Yeah, sever the bloodline takes out the desecration demon. And Michael Rooks going to get in with the plate mail. Now there's a Taskmaster post-combat. Brad now at 8 life. And so what we, could, what we could end up seeing next turn, Joey, is Haunted Plate Mail. Actually, we don't get to see the equip cost used very often right. of 4, but move the Plate Mail onto the Demon and get it in for 4 to finish the game. And Nelson does have access to Lingering Souls in the Grave Rector flashback to get some chumpers in the way. But right now, you know, his back's kind of against the wall right now. You can certainly say that Rooks is ahead in this game and only getting further ahead, and it's Brad's job to actually try to get back into it. You see Garrett relentless there in Brad's hand, but uh, Brad's going to go ahead and scoop him up. Yep. sees that he uh, is unlikely to win that game, and now we are tied up. Michael Rooks and Brad Nelson. One game apiece here in round one of the StarCityGames.com Open Series live from Baltimore. You can see the issue with that game, you know, Brad obviously being bottlenecked on mana. Yes, he yeah. did have Garrick Relentless to be able to take care of the Taskmaster, but what Rooks does is he just he just untaps, uh, activates his plate mail to make it a 4-4, activates both Muta Volts, gets into the last eight points of damage. So yeah. Brad taking a look at his hand, surveying his position, realizing that that's likely gonna be the outcome of the game, uh, and just picks it up and moves on to game number three. Doesn't look like he's gonna re-sideboard. You see him shuffling up pretty quickly. Um, Rooks unveiled more cards that game than he did in the first one. Um, I'm sure that Brad was aware that Muta, uh, Muta Late, excuse me, mm -hmm. was coming. But you know, now he's got a better idea of like, you know, there's haunted plate mail out there. Uh, I know he has homicidal seclusion from game one. He's probably got a better idea now of what Rooks' deck is doing. Mutable, I mean, I'm sorry, Mutilate. No, I'm, I'm doing it. Yep. <laughs> Mutilate looked really good that game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even, it, even for one or two, just yep. dealing with the Lingering Souls, because that was what Brad was able to do, being bottleneck. He was able to, to flood the board with 1-1s, and, uh, you know, a card like Mutilate is 
is great in that situation. So uh, Michael just had the exact cards to deal with what Brad was presenting on board. You know, the big question you have to ask yourself is, you know, is that an anomaly? Is that something that's right. going to happen? Because again, Nelson's Junk Aristocrats version, Junk Aristocrats deck this weekend is much bigger. Again, three Desecration Demon, three Loxon on Smiter, less Lingering Souls. Verils can get bigger and out of range. Same thing can be said of the one Scavenging Goose in his main deck. You know, I, I, of course, in that game that we just watched, me late being an absolute all-star, I think that in more in, in in more games, if you know if they were play a lot more games, I don't know how good Mutal would actually be against Nelson's deck. Again, he does have Sanford a lot of swamps, sixteen of them and twelve swamps and four overall teams. So yes, his Mutalites can actually keep pace with you know Locks on Smiter and can eventually get to Desperation Demon range. But again, no way for him to control that. Um, as we've seen over the first two games. So how good is Mutalite going to be, especially when he's going to be on the draw this game, too? Right. So he's going to actually have to, he's going to probably need Mutalite to actually chase down some things. Additionally, we know that removal isn't the greatest thing against Junk Aristocrats. So bringing yeah. Burger-type effects because of Voice Resurgence, because of Doom Traveler, stuff that's just kind of floating around, and how Brad balances his resources, they're not the best cards in the world. But I do agree with you that Mutalite was, of course, phenomenal that last right. game we watched. I mean, we were kind of criticizing it a little bit before, mm -hmm. <laughs> before that game about, you know, just kind of how poor it seemed to look in game one. Yep. Uh, at being only, uh, what, one or two. Yep. Actually, it was one, I think. Minus one, minus one. But it was it was perfect that game. Now, Brad played two copies of Lingering Souls yeah. in that. Do you think he brought in the third? You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, again, it's, it's this interesting situation where does Brad know what his opponent is playing? Now he knows that they're mutilates. Will he maybe sideboard them out? Did he board the third one in? He doesn't know that Rooks has Curse of Death Sold. I think if he knew that, he'd probably board all the mutilates out. Yeah. Or excuse me, the Lingering Souls out. Um, so it, there's a chance that he brought the third one in because it is a very good card just to get attrition-y and you know, chump the Taskmaster and do that sort of thing. We saw him right. cast two of them. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's two and there's probably a third one too. I'm sure he's, he wasn't shocked to see mutilate. Yeah, no, not at all. As the uh, the lone wrath effect, or the you know the, the best wrath effect I think in black. Even with like the even with his black green history of playing the deck, I, I don't think there's any surprise there. You know, I think that one thing that might be in Brad's mind right now is you know does he have life bane zombies somewhere in his 75? Right, right. Because we haven't seen that yet. Of course, we know that he doesn't. But you know, does that change the way that Brad's going to sideboard? So we're underway, both players lead with an overgrown tomb, and Brad's first play of the game is a Voice of Resurgence on turn two. Uh, here on turn three, he swings in with the Voice, knocks Michael to 18, and has a Skurzdag High Priest as the follow-up, along with an uh, appetite for brain. All right, he's getting his paper ready. <laughs> you see, Rooks <laughs> is going to read it. Brad's got his pen at the ready to say, all right, yeah. let's take a look. What do you have here, buddy? Taking notes. So we've got to sever the bloodline, a curse of death's hold, a putrefy, and what is that? Is that a thrag tusk? Yeah, thrag tusk. A couple of lands. Yeah, a couple of lands in swamp and uh, woodland cemetery, yeah. and then a homicidal seclusion. Oh, so he does that. have four lands, and the one that obviously sticks out probably to Brad is, hey, there's a curse of death's That card's pain in the butt for me, or was in Miami. Yeah. I don't know how much I care about it now in this game or in my in this particular matchup anymore because my deck is different. So I'm really interested to see what he's going to take here. Because yeah. like seclusion can be really good, Thrachos can be annoying, Sever can be annoying, and then Curse, depending on how Brad's draw is, how he's sideboarded, how that lines up, can be annoying as well. Yeah, a lot of good targets here for Brad, uh, but it, a lot of it depends on his his game plan for this game. He's going to take Sever. So Sever is exiled. Yeah, and that's a big one there, of course, as you mentioned, Exiled. That's what Appetite for Brains does. Right. Makes it go away forever, so no flashback on the Sever. It would be far away from flashing back anyway, but that's not even going to be an option anymore for Rooks. He's going to play a land, and he's going to play Future Fight to take care of the High Priest right away. We've seen him kill High Priest, like, immediately. Right. Whenever he's had the option to, so he realizes how it, how good it is against him. Yeah, and that's exactly what Brad said. You know, you, you play the High Priest early, expecting it to die. Yeah. Uh, if you really want to get use out of the High Priest, you are more likely to play it later. So I think Brad has some muscle, or at least a different plan than High Priest this game. But he's going to go ahead and play Underground, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Underworld Connections. So Brad looks like he's, I don't want to say he's gearing up for the long game, but he's getting ready for an attrition battle. Yeah. He knows that Rooks' deck has a lot of removal in it, Mutilates, Putrefy, Abrupt Decays, all that good stuff. He's got an idea of what's in Rooks' hand. He knows that Curse of Death's Hold is probably, you know, it's coming. Because if he wanted to take it, he would have. He chose not to. Now, the one thing that's going to be interesting to me to watch how this game's going to play out over the course of these next couple of turns is Brad has all the information. 
of what Rooks has. You know, there are a couple cards that he doesn't know about now because of draw steps, but, you know, he chose Sever the Bloodline. That was his choice to take that card instead of Thrashus, instead of Curse. So he's making a loud statement, Joey, that yeah. I'm not scared of those cards. Right. So uh, Brad draws a couple of cards, one at the end of Michael's turn, one on his, his turn using the uh, Underworld Connections, and follows it up with a Desecration Demon after swinging in with the Voice of Resurgence. Michael Rooks at 14 life. Brad at 18, or did, has he uh, played an untapped shot nope. this, this game? So just the 18 from the under, uh, Underworld Connections. So there's Thrag Tusk for Michael Rooks to get back a chunk of that life total, up to 19. And, you know, this might be part of the reason that, you know, Nelson did decide to take Sever instead of, you know, Curse or Thrag Tusk, because when you do have a Desecration Demon, you don't care about Thrag Tusk, you don't really care about uh, Curse of Desol, because that thing is so huge, and it's going to change the way that Rooks actually has to play the game. Now, if Rooks does draw another Putrefy, another removal spell, then things work out well for him, but I think Brad knew that, one, I don't really care about, you know, Curse or Thrag Tusk, and two, he's definitely going to Putrefy my, my, uh, my High Priest. That's what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. So, as a result, you know, he took the seven of the line, which would be the answer for Desecration Demon, and now he can start going to work with a 6-6 six, six flyer. So, Brad here in his uh, pre-combat main phase, presumably. You see, he's kind of asking himself, do I want to activate the Underworld Connections? How do I want to kind of lay out this turn? He's got a High Priest in his hand as well. He's got yes. a Hierophant Relentless there. So you see, he's going to go to his tax step, trigger, taps the demon and say, this trigger, do you want to activate it for Thraktos? Brooks says no. Going to come across for six and move into his second main. So Michael down to 13. And now Brad, it looks like he's going to play the High Priest here. He does. And it looks like he's uh, going to make his land drop there, Godless Shrine, pass. So. I, I kind of like this too, because, you know, what this is, again, the Underworld Connections, it's basically representing, hey, I'm I'm more than okay going long and playing an attrition battle with you. He only has one in his sideboard. He did draw it, but as a result, he actually can kind of set up and craft this game the way that he wants to. Appetite giving me information, knowing when he needs to play around, and now he's just saying, you know what, I'm happy to go long because I think my card advantage can actually grind you out and beat you. I think going to a long game, I'm better suited to win because of cards like Desecration Demon uh, and some of the, the other long game resources he has access to. So Michael Rooks Plays a land with a lone Thrag Tusk on board as his, uh, his only non-land permanent. Facing down Brad Nelson's Desecration Demon, Skurzdag High Priest, which is still summoning sick, yep. and uh, Voice of Resurgent. So you see five mana being tapped here for Rooks. He did play a Grim Backwoods for the turn for his land drop. I'm wondering what he has this turn. We know he has Homicidal Seclusion in his hand, so it would make his Thrag Tusk into a... 8-4 lifelinker, right. so a very sizable attacker, and he looks like that might, the be, seclusion here. might be coming sideways, yep. And so this is going to be an the ultimate, ultimate price. price. Yeah, the okay. one ultimate price, I believe, the one of in the sideboard, Brad yep. said, mostly there to kill Skurzdag High Priests. So now the beast is going to die, he should have a beast token coming in, so long as he does remember the trigger from Dragtoss, and that beast token, because again, he'll only control one creature, because of Homicidal Seclusion, we're looking at a 6-4 right. that does have lifelink. So Brad draws a card off of the Underworld Connection at the end of turn and now untaps. He's going to draw another card off of the Connections here. So a lot of... Uh, Brad's up a lot of cards just off of that Underworld Connection. I mean, it's a, scary, it's a scary feeling. Like, when you're facing against a deck that typically shouldn't be able to draw cards from Deck Aristocrats, you know, him being able to draw more cards, get to, you know, get deeper into his deck, find those synergies that make this deck so powerful. Again, you see the High Priest in play. It has not died, so that means that, you know, if a Cartel Aristocrat shows up or something else, now we can start coming out 5-5 five, five Demons, and if we remember Game 1, Rooks couldn't beat that. Yeah. So, uh, Brad gets in with the Desecration Demon. Michael decides he does not want to uh, sacrifice anything. So, Michael goes to 7. Brad follows up with a Garrick. A pilgrim and an Abyssin's Pilgrim makes a uh, wolf there with the Garrick. So Brad with a ton of dudes on board and uh, opportunity to make uh, some five fives. Pretty soon, potentially. I mean the, the the problem here for uh, the problem here for Rooks right is that you know he definitely wants to attack with the with the Todd Anderson Beast token. That's a 6-4. Right. But I, I think Brad will probably, you know, chump block with something, be a Voice Resurgence Wolf token, have right. his pilgrim, his choice. One of the things he's not going to chump block with is the High Priest. Right. And then as a result, 
you know, Morbid's active. He's got guys to be able to make it. But I think that Rooks is priced into attacking here because he's at seven and he needs right. to keep his life total high. Yeah, he actually needs the life total more than he needs the uh, necessarily needs the six four. But uh, yeah, Brad doesn't have anything that's going to. Uh, uh, there you, you see the Abyssus Pilgrim get in front of the, the yeah. beast there. So, okay. Oh, and a putrefy in response for the High Priest is going to stop that line of play from happening. So that's a really good attack there by yeah. Brooks. He comes in with the six four. Nelson is going to predictably block. Uh, he chooses to block with Abyssus Pilgrim before damage and anything happens. Putrefy takes care of the High Priest. So now there's going to be no morbid, no five five demon coming out. And he's actually going to get his life. Is Rooks. And then pass the turn back. So, actually, a pretty good turn, all things yeah, considered. Yeah, very good turn. So, right now, life totals 13 for Michael Rooks, 15 for Brad Nelson. Brad has a Desecration Demon, a Wolf, and a Voice of Resurgence alongside a Garrick Relentless on board. And Desecration Demon trigger at the beginning of combat. Michael says, Go ahead, you've got your 6 6. Bring it. And Brad looks like he's going to bring it with everybody. Wolf, Voice of Resurgence, Desecration Demon, all getting in. Michael with a 6-4 lifelinker due to that homicidal seclusion is uh, is just fine with that. Goes down to three. Nelson gonna make a wolf, make a Doom Traveler, pass the turn back, has some mana available. It looks like he's cardless. Yeah, Brad does appear to have no cards in his hand, which is a surprise considering the uh, Underworld connection. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of cards on board, though. So. Say, I'm genuinely surprised that he's cardless. I mean, it looks like he's cardless right now. Yeah. If he's not, he only has one or two cards in his hand. Rook's sitting here again with that 6-4 life-linking beast token. And he, I mean, again, I think he's in the situation where he's priced into attacking. Does he want to attack Nelson? Does he want to attack Garrick? That's his call. Um, but he does have to attack her. He is going to attack Garrick. Immediately, Nelson's going to block and make a spirit token off of Doom Traveler. Yes. So Garrick survives the turn. Doom Traveler does not, but a spirit Sign in blood, a little risky. Yeah, he is up to nine life off of that uh, life link. Now drops to seven, and he's got a follow up here. A drag tusk is going to go up to twelve. Okay, gaining a lot of life, uh, looking reasonable for Michael staying in this game despite Brad's uh, massive card advantage off of that underworld connections. And Nelson does have a couple cards in his hand. You see yeah, him in his he hand must right have been now. On the side, yeah. yeah. One thing to keep in mind now, too, Joey, is that because he does play a Thraxxus, does Rooks, yes, he does go up to 12, but now Seclusion's turned off. It is, Because yeah. he doesn't have a single creature anymore. Now, of course, the, the kind of unique thing here for Rooks' deck is that he can actually, in a way, control how many creatures he has in play. He could, you know, abrupt decay his Todd Anderson token. Right. You know, with some sort of sneaky attack, which, yeah, just, just send in with Thraxxus. Nothing going on here. And yeah. kill his own guy if he needs to. Right. So that's something that, that Nelson needs to be cognizant of, assuming that we get to see Rooks untap and go to another turn. Right. Brad's still at a healthy 15 with a lot of guys on board. Desecration Demon, a pair of wolves, Voice of Resurgence, and a Spirit Token alongside that Garrick Relentless just pumping out wolves. So we're in Brad's first main phase. He has not activated World Underworld Connections yet. You know, he's sitting at 15 life. He's going to Garrick and take care of Thraktusk. So he's just going to fight that and says, all right, get that off the table. I don't think that Rook's going to have a response. Yeah, so that's going to die. Beast Token's going to come in. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I think he has a backup character, right? Maybe? Uh, okay. So what we see happening here is... Okay, so he Garrett's takes care of the front half. Mm -hmm. The Beast Token comes in. And so now Nelson says, can I attack? This Grace Demon gets tapped. Rook sacks his Beast, says no. Tragic Slip takes care of the other Beast Token. And then Nelson gets in with all those guys and plays with Garrick. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite the turn for Brad. Clears the entire other side of the board. Still follows up with a Planeswalker. And uh, is able to knock Michael down to five off of a pair of wolves and the Voice of Resurgence. Notably, that demon is still around and now is he's 7-7. Seven, seven. Yep. And so what you saw that Brad do there with his Garrick Relentless is he fights his own spirit token to flip his Garrick Relentless into Garrick the Veil Cursed. So now he can represent a tutor for whatever he wants to next turn. Wouldn't be surprised to see him go get Obes of that yeah. next turn, assuming that that Garrick is still around. But now Rooks is, yeah, Rooks is in a difficult situation because that combat, as you said, went great for Brad. Yeah. Taking care of all of Rooks' stuff, that tragic slip, the desecration, even sacrifice, everything. And it, it's kind of strange, too, because with Rooks, him sacrificing that tap beast token, it would have left him with just one creature for homicidal seclusion, so he would have been in that situation where he would have had a 6-4 lifelinking blocker, but now he had a tragic slip to take care of that. 
We do see Michael with a Taskmaster in hand, so he can put a 4-3 uh, on board that will be a, uh, what, a 7-4 uh, lifelinker? Yep. And uh, that might get him out of this situation. As you mentioned, the Garrick over there representing a tutor. I don't know if Michael has an Abrupt Decay. That's his uh, probably his best removal spell for a flipped Garrick. Yeah, you see his hand right now. He's got a Death Rite Shaman. He has a Demonic Taskmaster. He has another copy of Homicidal Seclusion. And he's got a Mystery Card hiding in there as well. I think it's a... Oh, okay. It's the Curse. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, Curse from earlier. So those are the four cards that he's staring at. Again, Death Rite Shaman, uh, Demonic Taskmaster, Homicidal Seclusion, and that Curse of Desolde, which he's had since the beginning of the game. Right. And we talked about how good Curse of Desolde was against Brad's previous iterations of this deck. Mm -hmm. Again, if you if you remember that match in Grand Prix Miami of Ray Duke playing against Brad Nelson, how good Curse of Desolde was in that matchup. You see that Brad's deck has evolved, it's changed, and Curse is just significantly worse against right. his deck now. So Michael's going to go with the Taskmaster plan, but he's also playing a Death wow. Rite Shaman, which is interesting because of the, uh, the Homicidal Seclusion being de uh, deactivated due to the fact that he's got two creatures. Now he can sack the Deathrite Shaman to deal with the Desecration Demon. Maybe that's his plan to get yeah. his guy lifelink, but that's how he uh, decides to go with it. Brad draws a card at end of turn with the Underworld Connections, and uh, as Michael passes back, Brad at 14 life now. Ton of land, ton of dudes, and a Planeswalker. Yeah, and there's one important land in his hand, a one of in his deck, Gavney Township. Which, you know, you, you, could, you could argue that Brad is kind of flooding out a little bit here, but now yeah. this is actually going to give him something to do with all that extra mana that he's going to have moving forward. I don't think we're going to see a ton more turns in this game, mm -hmm. as the Gavin Township can certainly put things away uh, in a pretty quick fashion, but now he's actually got things to do with all the extra mana right. he's had. And I think that Gavin Township would have made that Curse of Death's Hold look a little silly uh, yeah. had Michael decided to go with that plan just to maybe shrink some of the guys, but yeah. Wasn't, that wasn't a very good plan anyway, yeah. considering his Desecration Demon was just going to kill him. You know, it really has to set off you know, some signals in your head if you're Rooks. That, that Appetite for Brains that we saw in turn number three, you know, Brad analyzing the hand and, and choosing, again, not to take Curse of Desolde, you know, you have, to be, you have to be of the mindset of, okay, like, this card was insane against this deck in, you know, months prior, right. and he's opting not to take this, so, okay, this probably isn't very good. Uh, if he's choosing not to take this card, as you can see, it's just not that good. It's he's going to actually sacrifice Desecration Demon to Garrick. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, Brad kind of seeing how Michael's trying to plan on uh, dealing with the Desecration Demon. Yeah. And he's going to go ahead and sacrifice the Demon to the Garrick to tutor up a second copy of Desecration Demon. Huh. Interesting. You think the logic is there? Color me surprised. I'm surprised, too. I thought he was going with Rob Zadat to, to kind of get the guaranteed to uh, kind of grind the last few life for yeah, I mean, uh, I, like So my thought process is that he doesn't want to go to the attack step with Desecration Demon in play because he doesn't want Rooks to be able to sacrifice a creature to turn on Homicidal Seclusion. Okay. That part of it makes sense to me. Okay. Also, he wants to you know probably turn on Morbid or what have you, but he could have done that if Desecration Demon was, was around. Right. Um, so that's not really a huge concern. But now he's what he's doing is he's turning all of his guys sideways um, Seclusion's not going to be online, and now he can represent a Gavney Township pump. So I actually kind of like this, because now, yeah. now Discretion Demon isn't in the way, Homicidal Seclusion isn't going to be online, and Rooks' blocks, none of them are good. Yeah. Because Seclusion isn't online, and Rooks can't gain any life now. So it's kind of a, it, it's a, it's a weird, like, kind of backwards play of right. sacrifice my 7-7 seven, seven Discretion Demon to get yeah, one six, to play right. post-combat. But it totally makes sense when you think, you know, not wanting to turn on that seclusion yep. uh, and not allow Michael to gain more life to get out of this game. So, Brad, right now, combat, uh, two wolves and a voice of resurgence coming in versus Michael Rooks's demonic Taskmaster and Deathrite Shaman, which, of course, if the Taskmaster lives through this combat, uh, he would have to, he's going to have to lose the Deathrite Shaman anyway, mm -hmm. so no, no reason to not chump block with the uh, the death right shaman. Yeah, and he's forced here to block both guys because Gavin, if he lets any guy through, he's going to be taking six damage again because we know that Rooks doesn't have a removal spell in his hand, so he's forced to do all the blocking, lose his Taskmaster as he draws another one for his turn. It's going to put him down to two after the dust settles. Right, and then a uh, Desecration Demon as the follow-up. Yep. Michael Rooks cannot clear the board, cannot deal with the onslaught uh, presented by Brad Nelson, so Brad 
takes the game and match. Two games to one versus Michael Rooks here in the first round. Oh, 